Since the recording is in progress, I will call this meeting of the Community Resources and Tourism Committee for September 12th, 2023 to order. Looks like we have all of our committee members in attendance as far as the roll call. Um, uh, approval of minutes from our last meeting. Does anybody want to make that motion? Chairman, I'd be happy to make that motion. Is there a second? <laughs> uh, any changes or updates to, to the minutes that anybody noticed? I didn't see anything. If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. No opposed, passes. Um, public comments. Are there any public comments that were submitted? I did not receive anything. We have one sort of member of the public. Do you have any comments in front of the committee? Okay. Uh, in which case, then we will uh, move on and uh, we'll move into uh, extension. And looks like uh, from uh, uh, we have uh, Kristen joining us remotely via Zoom. So let's uh, hear from Kristen. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I apologize for not being there. I I couldn't be in two different places at the same time. So I've got two meeting night meetings here in Chippewa. So I, uh, I apologize for not being able to be in done tonight. Um, not a lot of updates uh, from the extension office. Um, we've been working on the budget. And um, I, I believe from what I've heard from Melissa, the last meeting, everything is clarified and, and the committee has, um, had passed the extension budget last month and things are, uh, so the questions were answered, so that's good. Um, at the next meeting, I'll likely bring forward the contract for your review and that's just for review only. Chris will sign that contract at the end once the, the final budget passes. Um, but um, I do like for committee members to see the contract just so that there's complete transparency and what that looks like and uh, what's in there. Um, so I'll bring that forward, just a template, probably put the rough numbers in there just so you can see that. And then uh, at the end, uh, the county manager signs that, that contract. Um, but other than that, um, we've got some strong work happening in Dunn County. You have exceptional educators. There's not a lot of uh, um, drama or anything happening in, in uh, Dunn County. So it's just uh, going smoothly. Melissa at the helm has kept everybody in tack, on track and the office on track. So um, it's, it's running smooth. So any questions or concerns or thoughts, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer. Larry? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got uh, two way to goes for you. Uh, one, was Mar one was Margaret out here watering plants on the day that I was here and it was about 100 degrees. <laughs> and I know those plants had not been in the ground long and uh, the environment was doing everything it, it could to uh, wipe them out. But I'm sure she and other folks uh, I uh, grabbed the garden hose and did a nice job. And uh, I wanted to recognize her for uh, for that deal. And then the, the other one is, you know, you hear it all the time, but uh, Jerry Clark was on uh, the, the radio this morning at a great presentation. And uh, uh, Jerry's not going to be with us forever. You know, you can't work for extension for 70 years. You know, if he could, he probably would. But, you know, I think the extension agent uh, program, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes, is very important on the radio to, uh, to get out what's going on, to encourage people to uh, participate in uh, some of the activities that extension has. And uh, even one time um, when Louisa was on and I saw her and I, and I, with the four H years ago, and I said, and she says, "Well, I didn't think anybody would be listening." Well, I says, "Well, I was listening, and I'm sure there was many other people listening." And uh, it's it's kind of a tradition of extension that I could see uh, fading away, and I sure hope it doesn't. Thank you. 
I appreciate that. And uh, actually, it's an interesting, well, two things. Um, there was a, a a really big group effort with the watering of those plants. As you know, they, yeah, the weather has not cooperated, cooperated well. We had, uh, Melissa was a big part of that, as was uh, we had some volunteers even come and, and water them. So there, that was a great effort. So I appreciate everybody doing that. Um, and uh, incidentally, Melissa and I just had a conversation um, earlier this week regarding getting um, uh, taking a look at some of the news and media outlets and reconnecting with those. Um, you know, we have the new educators. We've got um, a relatively well, a, a, a really new and young in the terms of experience uh, in extension, except for Jerry uh, now. But um, and uh, so we need to reconnect with those media sources and start putting some news releases out and um, uh, promoting our programs more. So I appreciate that um, little reminder, and it is something that's on our radar. So. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Anybody else have any questions or comments for Kristen? Um, did you have uh, any additional, uh, are you, you know, we obviously did the budget and uh, the contracts coming up. Do you have any other uh, for your financial report? Do you have anything else uh, that you wanted to report beyond that? Uh, no, we're on track doing well. Um, you know, Melissa, does the, you know, pretty much keeps a good tabs on that and keeps me informed really well. So um, it's just been a really good transition, um, I think. And yeah, so we've got a good team put in place. We're doing well with the budget. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll move on to the written extension updates, which you uh, got in your packet. Did anybody have any uh, comments or questions about uh, any of the uh, updates from uh, some of the uh, other educators uh, that were included in your packet? If not, then we're going to move on to our extension educator presentation and put Zach in the hot seat to talk about uh, 4-H. All right. Thank you. I think you guys can probably see me better here than from up on the podium. So I'll just stay right here. But I do have a slideshow to present to you. Um, our 4-H year just ended last month, so tonight I will present to you the 2023 State of the Clover Address. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the final numbers we had as we closed out the year, um, talk about some of the things that I've been doing since I came on, mainly uh, the spring and the summer, and then kind of some ideas of where I hope the program can go in the future. So um, this is a snapshot of Dunn County's enrollment from, like, like I said, at the end of the year, so end of August. Um, we ended up with 277 members, and that is up 5.3%. Um, our first year members is 71, which is up 47.9%, which is really good. Um, so if you look down a little bit lower, you can see that last year's enrollment was 263, uh, and our first year members last year is 48. So looking at, at that compared to the state numbers, um, the state enrollment was up 8.2%, so we're a little bit lower than the state average, um, but our first year members, the state first year members were 19%. So we're high, much higher than the state in our first year members. So like I said, that 5% wasn't too much, but if you look at our trends over the last few years, um, unfortunately, enrollment has been going down, um, especially you can look over at 2020, the COVID year uh, took a hit. So this is the first year in about five years that we have seen an increase in 4-H members. So even though it's small, it's still there. So I think that's really awesome. So some of the things that we've been doing, um, I've been getting out to have some informational booths and action centers at some involvement fairs. Um, so some of the places that we've been out to, um, went out to Elk Mound um, High School, actually uh, middle school. Um, I was at UW Stout, we were at Colfax Fair, Paint the Town, um, Dunn County Fair, obviously, Downsville Days, and the Menominee Middle School are just a few of the places we've been to. I mean, one thing I do want to say is you see my intern, Sam, in that picture. 
a lot of the stuff I've been doing this summer wouldn't have been possible without the extra help this year. So that was really helpful. Doing these booths by yourself is a lot of work. Um, doing it with just one person is also a lot of work as you're trying to inform people about the program and have hands-on activities for the kids coming up. So it was really nice having that extra help this summer. Um, so like I said, some of the booths, um, I had some educational activities for just the community members, um, using it as a way to have some outreach and a way to spread some education throughout the community, not just to 4-H members, um, but also selfishly to teach them about the program and to try to get them to get more involved with it. Um, and others, like at the middle school, it was just more of an informational, this is what 4-H is about. Um, so that's one of my former students, Miranda there, who is now in middle school and looks like she's almost taller than me, um, <laughs> posing for the picture with me. So, um, and my other goal with that is also just to kind of spread the word about 4-H. I think I mentioned this before, but when I was teaching before I had this job, we got some handouts to send home with the students. And many of the students, actually none of the students, except for the three who were involved in 4-H, didn't even know what it was. So even if this doesn't get us more enrollment, at least the clovers out there were out there. You know, I had somebody this summer say, oh, yeah, I saw you three times already. So like they, they know it's an option. If they don't take it, no, that's okay. You know, everyone's busy. But at least people are getting more aware that 4-H is still alive and well and more than just animals. So a um, few other things that we've been doing. I put on some summer project days. So I did a series of four project days this summer. Um, and how I came up with the projects was kind of two ways. I looked at the data that we have and I saw which ones were the most popular for our 4-H members. And I also went with what volunteers I had available. Um, I had two volunteers come up and approach me about doing projects and I wasn't going to say no. So we have a paint, we did a painting project um, that one of my good friends came in and led for us. Um, and we did a photography project day that my wife led for us. And then um, we kind of doubled up on the food. So on the left, you see they're doing some food preservation. Um, and on the right, they're doing some food and nutrition lessons and they make some healthy snacks. And that one, we, like I said, we kind of doubled up on the food because I had those volunteers that wanted to come and lead a project. So um, if I have the help, I'm going to use it. So that's why we did two of those. But they were successful. We had um, anywhere from three to 10 kids show up at each time. So something I'm pretty sure I'll be carrying on again next summer. And there's a couple other things that just kind of lead themselves. I shouldn't say that we have really good volunteers and leaders to run them, but things that I'm a little more hands off with is 4 8 softball. Um, we ran that program again. So this is a picture of the juniors league. We had about juniors are ages eight to 12. We had about 16 kids come up, show up each time for that one. And seeing this picture, it's a little less. This was the first day that they got together. Um, and then senior league is 13 years and older, and they've had about give or take 20 kids come up to come to each one of those. So they ran once a week um, throughout June, throughout July, and took a break during the fair and then through August again. Um, club meetings, again, something that I'm more hands off with, but I did have the opportunity to go and visit most of the clubs at this point. I'm trying to get out to all of them. I think I have about three left um, and you never know what you're going to find. Like there might be a lamb at a club meeting. <laughs> so it's always really fun just to get out and talk to the volunteers, meet more of the youth, kind of see what what they need from me and what I can do to help them out. Um, and then of course the fair was always big for us. So I couldn't pick just two pictures for the fair. So I just have a few for the judging. And then it's always great to see the kids always excited about their projects and wanting to show them off. Sometimes I just play cards with the kids because, you know, why not? <laughs> and then at the fair, we have the uh, 4-H awards ceremony. So we 
honored all the graduating seniors. Uh, there are a few youth that won some awards that they had to apply and interview for. Um, and then we had one volunteer award this year given out. Oh, you were on the dangerous death defying stage. Yes. <laughs> yes, we were. <laughs> yeah. And then one more thing I wanted to talk about. I'm sure I did more that I can't even remember, but I organized just like a fun night out for the 4-H youth. So we partnered with the Speedway and Ellsworth Creamery donated some cheese for us to do a race night. So um, August 18th, after the fair was done and right before kids got back to school, we all got together. We did a little pre-party beforehand and then we had about 15 youth show up and we all just, they got to go on the track and do the pledge for everybody and then we all sat in the stands together and just a good time to get some belonging and build some relationships amongst the 4-H members all right so what i'm looking to do next and some of the stuff is in the works already um more promotion 4-H week will be coming up in october so i've already got set up with a couple of schools um up in Boyceville to go up and do some programming up there to promote the program, talk to some kids, that sort of thing. Um, and we'll be doing a display in the library display case in town again. Um, we have a few new groups and clubs. Um, some are new, some are kind of revamped. So the Youth Activities Council, that's actually been going since May. That's like our older youth group for members in sixth grade and older. Um, we got that started again. And we'll continue with that. A um, couple of really great volunteers were very excited about doing a photography club for me. Um, one is Melissa and one is my wife. So <laughs> they will be um, meeting at a monthly basis. Um, so something's a little unique. I don't know if any other counties that have a photography club that meets on a regular schedule, but like I've said, that's one of the biggest projects statewide and in Dunn County. So I thought like that was a pretty good need and um, they were both more than happy. I thought I was gonna have to talk my wife into it to tell you the truth, but they were both really excited and more than happy to do that and work with that for us. Um, and Small Animal Project kind of took a break for a little bit. We got some new leadership for that. Um, if you went to the fair, you noticed that the Small Animal Project was pretty small. So we're gonna try to <laughs> drum up a little more. I, I didn't mean to have a pun, but it was, I mean, it, it's true. Um, Try to drum up a little more business for that within the 4-H um, members and see if we can't get a few more small animals at the fair next year. Um, we have tri-county events coming up just this fall. We'll be doing a STEM day partnering with CVTC. Um, and our speaking contest is going to be in November, which originally it was along with our performing arts festival. We separated that out. Um, and we have more things coming up um, besides those two we'll be doing or you again with um, Stout, and we'll be doing uh, the Performing Arts Festival and a bunch of other stuff as well that I probably can't even think of right now. Um, and the final thing that I wanted to talk about real quick is trying to partner with other youth organizations. Um, and this goes to the AmeriCorps member that I have been awarded this year. I think at the last meeting, there might have been some questions about it, and I wasn't here to answer those. So I'll explain that a little bit. Um, the statewide 4-H applied for a grant to get AmeriCorps members within the counties. And I applied to have one and I was awarded a member that will start in January and go through next August. And the idea behind it, the way the grant was written was to increase capacity for 4-H through another youth organization. Um, so right now I'm looking at contacting the Boys and Girls Club, um, but if that doesn't pan out, there's other places I can go. And having that member go and do 4-H activities and lead a 4-H club or at least 4-H club activities through this youth organization with the idea that we all kind of have the same goal in mind with those youth. Um, so like I said, it was a grant that was written. Um, a lot of the, um, the money, the stipend that they'll get comes from that grant and they'll get an education award at the end of it as well. So that's something that we're looking forward to. Any questions? Supervisor Bjork. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this weekend, and I'm not sure who the, the 
organizers are. But I have a brother-in-law that says he's taken the whole weekend to help teach kids uh, firearm safety at the rifle range just a uh, mile or two from here. Hmm. And, uh, um, you know, I, I would assume that kids that are in, you know, shooting sports are all tuned into it. But, you know, here you've got like an adult organization that f finds a big part of their mission to educate kids about firearm safety. So if we can help them get kids there. That'd be a great thing. And, uh, you know, the AmeriCorps discussion came up in that a uh, little more water on the seed we planted here. Uh, I think it'd be a great thing come fair time that uh, if we've got kids that are part of the homeless group that may be or may not be at Stepping Stones, I'm not familiar what they're going to do, that uh, those kids get a chance to team up with somebody and get a trip to the Dunn County Fair. Pretty easy walk. Mm -hmm. So um, again, it says, you know, spreading spreading the idea of 4-H and, and uh, youth in development and, and involvement in, in different things. And I, I, you know, who knows what can come out of something like that, but I find it real interesting to think about it. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. Exactly. Thank you. Anybody else on the committee have any comments, questions for Zach? If not, great report. All right. Thank uh, you. It's, uh, it's really impressive what you kind of managed to kind of get done in the first year. So it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun watching how far it goes. So, yeah, thanks. One last thing I forgot to mention is I'm doing a lot of um, professional development and I have to be in Stevens Point at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. So I'm going to head out after this, <laughs> but thank you guys so much. <laughs> professional development we all need it thanks zach um okay moving on it's time for an economic development update does anybody here have anything for us i actually have something but i'll wait till i'll wait till i hear from our illustrious county manager all right um just real briefly um bob bassani um is going to is has uh, resigned, retired, um, is leaving the um, Dunn County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, his last day will be the 15th, which must be a couple of days away, Friday. Um, and so uh, they are now in the process of doing some communica communication with the Greater Menominee Development Corporation and just other partners to figure out what's a reasonable plan moving forward for coverage and um avoiding duplication and uh, sort of maximizing the best of what all the organizations bring to the table. So um, that will be happening here shortly. All right. We had heard that this, that was happening. So, um, and I wanted to share something with you guys. So I'm signing in Melissa. So, and, uh, just something for uh, you guys to kind of think about. Um, I was at uh, last, was it last month? No, it's still this month. Cause it's still September. No, it was August. Right. Um, the Chippewa County Economic Development Corporation had their annual meeting. Um, I invited a, a couple of uh, one of the current board members, Steve Lindbergh, who's on Dunn County's board and, Stacy Wakefield, who was the former interim director, to to attend, and if I could share my screen, I share. I want to just show you guys just some a couple of images from the event. Um, but I kind of wanted you guys just to kind of look at this is their annual meeting. Uh, they had over. Uh, 500 people in attendance um, did a really good breakfast though by the time I got to it it was all gone all that was left was um, I think a piece of fruit <laughs> uh, they awarded uh, uh, eight businesses um, 
different business of the year awards. These were like custom made. I'm trying to remember the business that that custom made these. Um, but this kind of shows how big the 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 crowd was. They had a a, a speaker that that spoke. This was at uh, Country Jam's uh, new facility uh, in uh, in which is actually in Chippewa County, though it's north of Eau Claire. And this was just some of the. Uh, some of the award winners, plus they had, as you can see, there were a couple of state, uh, one state senator, a couple of state representatives on hand to present these awards. And I kind of wanted just to point that out just for you guys, to, for this committee to think about if, um, if Chippewa County can kind of do this, there's no reason why Dunn County can't kind of attract you know a, a crowd and and do this type of thing but it's going to probably require more investment from the county than it does now because right now Chippewa County invests quite a bit into the the Chippewa County Economic Development Corporation plus they do have their um uh, uh corporate partnerships and community partnerships as well but you see the the growth in business there with like that huge uh, fleet farm distribution center. Mason Shoe just built a, a massive facility out there. So the amount of money that they put into it is being returned quite a bit with not only the economic development, but then also all the, the business that has expanded in the area. So I, I kind of wanted to share this since this was fresh. I, I helped the the Chippewa County EDC hires me to do all the videos for the event and I usually do the PowerPoint and then the day before uh Charlie sprung it on me that he wanted me to take photos at, of everything I go wait a minute I'm already running all the videos and and so you want me to take photos yeah can you do that so that's why I had all the photos because I had to take the pictures um but I, I think that that we should you know uh, at some point think about whether that's something that this, you know, county should do. Should we, should we, especially as there's a transition with a, with a director at this point, is it worth thinking about that this county should make more of an investment in economic development uh, compared to, uh, you know, to what Chippewa is doing, what some of the other uh, surrounding counties are doing. And I'm not asking for like any input at this point. I just kind of want to, to throw it out there because like i said uh just did this meeting last month and it was fresh and i wanted to to share it to just kind of give you guys some some food for thought so um i don't have it you guys don't have to comment at all but you can think about it so give it some thought i would just say i'm not even sure that it would will what will we result necessarily would it would, that it would be necessary to have additional funding. I think it's using the existing funding that's out there more strategically between the counties, the city, the um, partnerships with the various uh, businesses that support the GMDC and the DCEDC. Um, I think we can do a better job of that. Definitely. I mean, I, like I said, I mean, to have... And he usually during those annual meetings, usually the the governor attends. He wasn't at this particular one, but pretty pretty much most of the all the previous meetings that they've had, they they get the the governor to attend and make a and that's that's a pretty big deal to have that you know on a it's always on like a Thursday morning in the middle of the week uh, to get an appearance by the the governor of the state to to promote economic development in Chippewa County. It, makes makes them look bigger than they are they are perhaps supervisor quinn oh thank you uh so we we used to have a banquet every year until about five years ago i suppose and it just probably was too much for the corporation to pull together given their limited resources but that it, in terms of what chris is saying i mean it might be that even just like funding something like that or helping putting resources to helping the, them do something like that uh, we used to get 250 people to come to a meeting and hear a speaker and it wasn't all that great but uh 
<laughs> but it it could be. I can see how it could be if if it had if it more time went into thinking about the program and uh, getting an uh, excellent speaker. Um, and I think they offset most of the cost of that meeting by getting a lot of things donated. They have um, uh, major sponsors of the event that offsets uh, the costs for the food and um, the program stuff gets donated. So it's I, I don't know that that the EDC actually spends a, a significant part of their budget on their particular meeting. So. It's a lot of time yeah, and staff support, and which is something we might, might be able to help with. Yeah. So again, I just kind of put it out there as, as food for thought. Um, next, Dunn County Communications. So I know that this is a, just a kind of a standard agenda item, um, not really anything significantly different in our communication. I continue to work with Doug. He put out a... Uh, Message today about the Myron Park, today or yesterday, about the Myron Park transfer, um, which is just kind of one of those little stories that captures people's uh, attention. He is working on some stuff related to budget. Um, it can, remains a, a good working relationship. Um, had a week or a month off with like out at county manager video. We're going to do one of those later on this week. Um, working on, yeah, just the same things we've been working on for the year. So that continues to make good progress. Excellent. Any uh, questions for Chris about communications? No, I will actually have an item for you uh, later that we can add to the, uh, the list. Uh, moving on to... Uh, broadband discussion. We'll invite Dan up. Um, the kind of couple of updates. Uh, the task force um, actually will come before the executive committee uh, tomorrow. The uh, language for that is that technically an ordinance or a resolution? Ordinance. Ordinance. Uh, that will come before the uh, the executive committee tomorrow, and that should be then well underway. We've had some uh, active uh, enthusiasm for people joining the broadband task force, so that's that's wonderful as well. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, the the ordinance is all written. So yes, you'll start to see that after well when the full board um, meeting materials come out, but it. Jim has, has seen it. It essentially outlines what we talked about uh, a month ago. Um, and so, yeah, that it is an ordinance update, so it will require two readings. Um, but I I, uh, I guess in addition to that, I, technically you couldn't work as a committee, but you could start <laughs> doing some things in an unofficial uh, uh, way prior to that. Um, I have... Just because I, I know in the past, a part of this has been broadband, got been forgotten for a little while. So I wanted to make sure that we continue to um, move forward as we're working on the committee work. So I have been attending a lot of the area broadband related activities that are that are going on. Um, most recently, last week, the Public Service Commission and UW Extension put on a uh, Oh, what do we call that? A regional broadband workshop. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was a two-day activity at uh, Northwood Technical College in in Rice Lake, where service providers and uh, municipalities and counties and whoever were invited. It is one of four of these workshops that they're putting on statewide. Uh, next closest one is in Toma in two weeks. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it's UW Extension people kind of going over a um, toolkit that they've started to put together to help um, government agencies in the planning for BEAD, essentially, uh, going over what what your options are, how you can go about it, some case studies about how it's been done in, in other areas throughout the throughout the state, um, useful information. 
Uh, one thing we do learn through that is even as we look in our region, we all have our own unique problems. <laughs> um, and, and it just comes down to our geography and the providers that are available to us. So a lot of the, a lot of the counties in Northern and Northeast Wisconsin have no providers. So their options are, are different. Uh, there was a presentation from Taylor County, which is two counties away from us. So on the, uh, on the east side of Eau Claire County, right? I get that right. Um, and the issues that they have, that they don't have providers. Um, and then we have Eau Claire County, which is uh, in a in decent shape, but, you know, with a big city and then some rural areas outside of it, that's a different way of looking at it. In Dunn County, we have a unique uh, issue that we have five internet providers that have received grants in our in our county so it's a you know, well, i shouldn't say there's five cooperatives so that doesn't include the big ones being spectrum at&t uh tds is now uh serving parts of menominee and uh i feel like i'm forgetting another one but century uh, whatever <laughs> century link tell century link yeah yes bright slash bright speed um so, yeah, when I talk about the five, those are <clears throat> regional telephone cooperatives that are providing internet. So 24-7, Mosaic, NextGen, Telecom, Tech, and Bloomer. Thank you. It's going to fail on that fifth one. <laughs> uh, so kind of a unique problem that we have. Um, and it's hard to call it a problem, but, you know, we need to... Uh, um, even though these areas are are not covered and we have competition, nobody is going to go in there without additional funding um, because essentially there's no there's no payoff. So but so it's a unique thing that we have to deal with is how do we work with five providers in order to impartially kind of provide our partnership, whereas other areas are doing what they can to pull somebody in in order to serve those areas. So just unique, different ways of uh, of going about that. We've also received uh, an update from NTIA, which is the National Telecommunications and Information Agency. Don't quote me on it. It's something to that effect. <laughs> um, they are the agency that's actually overseeing the BEAD grant. So they're, they're, they are the federal arm that is kind of choosing who gets the money and how that is all being managed. So uh, there is a, each state has their own representative. I think I had shared this be before. Um, uh, our representative for the state of Wisconsin lives in Hudson. So we're very lucky in that uh, they're uh, kind of, in our region. And so I've seen her face to face multiple times. She came to, did she come in person to one of our task force meetings? If not, I did meet with her face to face in the, in the office. So, um, so that's a really nice kind of asset to have in the area, but she gave us an update about kind of what the state is up to and kind of the status of the bead, uh, grant process. Um, <laughs> it's it's a, a federal grant so it's complex um it, the state has completed their five-year plan that they had to submit as part of the um i don't believe it was called the initial proposal it's some other type of proposal but essentially they just said hey we're working towards this grant and so that's that's kind of step one um the next step is the initial proposal that the state will be is working on right now and will be submitting by the end of this calendar year, I believe. At that point, that is where they're going to define where all of the spots in the state of Wisconsin that are unserved or underserved are. There'll be a process, and that also needs to be defined in there to be able to kind of work through that but what is served and what is unserved is 
somewhat prescribed by the federal government in the FCC's national broadband map. But there's other processes that require a government agency and a service provider to kind of work with uh, the federal government in order to add a spot. So when you talk about, when I talk about that, that is somebody's house where they can say, I don't have internet. Um, the federal government, the federal broadband map could say, your house isn't there, so it's not covered. So somebody has to go tell the federal government, nope, there's a house there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and that can, a service provider cannot do that. That hmm. must be done by a government agency. And so then once the government agency says, hey, there's a house there, then a service provider has to come in and say, no, we cover that or that isn't covered by anybody. So there's kind of a, there's a process to, to doing all of that. And that's some of the work that you had seen. If you ever saw some of the surveys, the federal, the FCC map things, the challenges that came out, that was a, that was kind of the initial part of building those, those maps. So anyway, that work is going to be done. The state needs to define their plan and how they're going to kind of work through that whole process. And then they're going to need to define their rules and how they are going to decide who the sub-grantees are. Sub-grantees being the service providers in most cases. It can be a municipality um, or a county can actually apply directly for these grants. Um, so they need to define that process. That will then get approved. The goal is to have that approved and to start receiving grant applications in June of 2024. Less than a year. Yeah. Okay. That process then will last for a year. So that kind of call for proposal, that's the, the schedule that the state has out right now calls for that to take a year. And that will be asking for subgrantees who is going to do all of this work for the next five years after that. So that will last for a year and then they will know everybody that they want to do that. They then submit that to NTIA for NTIA to say, yep, sounds good. And then work can start to happen in 2025, essentially. So long process, <laughs> um, but it's going to also happen very quick. As you look at in, in the past, the some of these grants. So like the last grant round that, that the state managed was for, I want to say like $20 million. It wasn't even $20 million, but this is 1 billion. Uh, so um, there is going to be a lot of people interested. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on. And, and when I say that that year happens, that is a proposals have to come in. The Public Service Commission has to review them. They put them, make them available to challenges by other providers to say, no, that if we're covering that area. Don't give them money to do that. That whole process is what will kind of take that that year from June of 2024 to June of 2025. You said that um, the providers can't challenge those maps or the, that house. Right. That they can't. So is that something that the new task force as a, you know, official part of the county or whatever can be that agency that can challenge it? So that's a that's a good role then for that to have. Yeah. So as the. As a grant is put together or a proposal is put together by a service provider, they're going to say we're going to cover the township of Hay River. These are all of the service points that we are going to cover. Um, and if they have a service point in there that isn't on the map, that could lead to that not being granted because you can't receive money to provide service to an area that's already been covered or doesn't exist. So then they'd have to go through that process. The service providers are quite well aware of these maps. They are required to quarterly provide uh, essentially their coverage areas 
and they don't have to provide their coverage areas, but they go back and tell the FCC, I got that one, I got that one, I got that one. Um, so they kind of fill that in. They know those areas. And so they they have in the past had an opportunity to challenge whether there was a place to provide there. Um, but it's kind of an ever-changing um, map. So it's this map and that process is not a mystery to them. They're, they're kind of well-versed in that, hmm. but, but now we're at the point where they don't have that, where they, they did kind of put a separation in there and the state can also request to get things added. So a service provider can go in there and say, I'll show you a picture of the house. <laughs> but uh, um, so, and the other thing is that they're going to want, the state's going to want you, the grant is going to want you to cover all of the areas there. And the map also has flaws where they identified a shed as a service location. And the service provider would be like, no, that, that's that's just, that's a shed. <laughs> that's hey, not... it could be a high-tech <laughs> shed where there's all sorts of high-tech stuff happening. It could be. Um, <clears throat> it, or it could be a shed. A shed. <laughs> so, um, so, so there's different different issues that kind of go on through that whole process. So um, that timeline and the, I, I knew it was a five year grant process, like five years of build. Um, but I think what kind of surprised a lot of people is, is the way that the state has done these grants in the past is we're going to take $200,000 or $200 million and we're going to award that. And then when there's some left over, then we're going to award the leftovers and then we're going to come into the next next year we're going to do the next 200,000 and and so they would kind of take that billion dollars over 5 years and do 200,000 every year for 5 years but that's not the way this one is set up is you they will determine all of those grants in one year and then there's essentially a 5 year build process hmm. and and that's where a lot of the the next kind of piece of work and some of the discussion there. And as we had the uh, meeting at Northwoods Technical College is who can do this work? Uh, <laughs> that's an influx of, so the billion dollars is the grant money. So that doesn't include the match money. So you're actually looking at closer to maybe $2 billion worth of actual funds going into doing broadband and that's just in the state of Wisconsin, Minnesota is going to be doing the same thing. Michigan's going to be doing the same thing. So in Illinois. So, I mean, when you look at that from a workforce standpoint, how do you find the people to be able to do that? And frankly, the raw materials, but uh, uh, so uh, Northwest technical college does have a program <laughs> that is uh, uh, throwing out uh, telecommunications technicians and as fast as they can. And I believe CVTC partners with them in some way, shape or form in that. So uh, this is kind of the update that, that I had from that work group. And I think Jim is planning on attending. The yeah. I'm going to probably go to the one in Toma. So, so, um, so should be good. Any uh, questions, comments uh, for Dan? Supervisor Bjork. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dan, is it to Dunn County's advantage or disadvantage to have uh, more residential sites? My, my, my question goes to the point where uh, I may have this spot up in Otter Creek that we uh, camp in uh, or, you know, have a shed or a cabin uh, uh, for the summer or deer hunting through the end of the year. Uh, but this is the place that we want to build and retire sometime. Uh, do we want that listed as a residence or is it to our advantage not to? Um, I would say it would probably be to the advantage to say that it is. Um, and the reason for that is more on the match funding side. So as you look at running fiber for 
10 miles to serve 10 houses, right? right. That could cost a service provider $200,000. Um, so you have 10 houses there, you know, what is your payoff, right? How long is it going to take that service provider to get back their money? So if that cost 200,000 and let's say the service provider is then going to put in 100 and the grant is going to be 100. So now they have to get $100,000 back. As, as we talk to service providers there, the first thing that they're going to look at is what's our take rate. So of those 10 houses, how many of them are going to actually subscribe to our internet? Um, they hope and expect if they're the only provider there that they're going to get about 80%. So they're now looking at these 10 houses and saying, I'm going to get eight houses. It's going to cost me. How long is it going to take me to get my $100,000 back from eight houses? <laughs> um, they, as, as they said, they're looking at five-year rate on return. So when you look at a house, they're typically charging about $100 a month for internet, maybe a little bit more, but just for easy math, call it $100. $100 so that's $1,200 a year. Times are eight houses. Now I got into math that I can't do in my head. Uh, <laughs> get right. So yeah, but 10 houses is better than eight. And so the other piece of that is so like I, in that scenario, I said, all right, the, the service provider is going to put in 100,000 and the grant is going to be for 100. If there's more houses, the service provider will put more of their own money into it. And then there's less grant more money from the service provider and less grant makes it more likely to receive that funding. So we want uh, to so, move up there and then yeah. we'll have more houses. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a it, it's kind of a balance on on how all of that that works. But yeah, it, I mean think of it really think of it from that service provider standpoint. If this is a their number, they'll they'll apply for a grant. If it's going to be 100% funded and they can put stuff in there, they'll take it because they're making money day one, right? <laughs> so the amount that they're putting next to that is, I want to get my money back in five years. If 80% of these houses do that at this rate, this is how much money I can put in. That's kind of the the math that a, that a service provider is doing. Just for reference, if they're the second one coming in, they're looking at 40%, so, um, which means they have less money to go in as, as the secondary provider. Any other uh, math questions for Dan? Yeah, I got to pull my calculator out before I do that. I always start grabbing these round numbers so it'll work. And then, <laughs> all right. Good update. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda. Um, I am going to share my screen again so that you guys can all see this. It's visitduncounty.com is now live as of today. So the this site is now officially launched and ready to go. And this is... Uh, Chris, what I had said would be a good uh, uh, PR piece for Doug to work on. Um, this has been a, a really long uh, process uh, to get this, mostly because of uh, the the difficulty in, in getting uh, people to just submit information. So uh, really worked on with Dave, the provider, to... Uh, task him with with uh, getting at least things in every category so that there would be uh, stuff in here. I figure that, you know, again, if you build it, they'll come and they'll be able to see that everything that uh, that's on the site. Uh, it's got information about the, the municipalities, businesses, uh, events. Um, I took a picture of Dave, the web guy, uh, rolling across uh, the Red Cedar Trail because we needed a, a good shot of a person on the bike that we didn't want to take from another site, but we really liked it. So we, we just re recreated the same image uh, of him doing that. But 
Uh, there are a few events that are already uh, preloaded in here as far as upcoming events. And then when people want to uh, learn more, they can click on something. It actually shows a, a countdown to the event, gives you details, shows the, the, the venue. People are actually able to, to map it. They can click on uh, an item to, to actually share it online. And it has information about uh, the organizer. Each uh, it does have a thing on the bottom that says "Help us grow," and that's also on the the top of the the site as well. Um, then there are categories for um, uh, different things to do, so uh, dining and drinking, and so they can see them outline on a map uh, wherever they happen to be in in Dunn County. And then everything is like categorized with a with a photo and a name, has their website, uh, other information um, about it. So if somebody wants to learn more about Applebee's, they can click on it. And again, it has uh, their their basic information on here. Um, and if you recently viewed something, it will show you all your recently viewed uh, items in there. There's a, a brief uh, uh, description. Um, and and again another map people can actually do uh put their location in there so they can get a map to a location which might be more uh um essential for something that's out of the way in uh, elsewhere in Dunn County but again uh, same thing with uh, uh lodging uh on here with uh different places and there's the recently viewed listing shows up here on the right um but different places to stay. And uh, there are other categories that um, that there were only like a couple of listings that we, we he, you know, we two of us found as far as stuff. And so we just uh, didn't even display them on here until we get some opportunity. But we figure that with the, the site starting to get um, some press, businesses, organizations are going to go, oh, I want to be on there because they'll see that they'll, there's something else on there. Uh, communities are listed as far as um, where they are, maps. Um, there's links to all the uh, cities, villages, and, and towns. Uh, each of the, some of the towns are on here uh, as well. Uh, so it's it's got a, a lot of information, and then it's got a thing where, you know, help us, us grow, where people can uh, can submit information about um, their their events, their businesses, uh, their what have you. So um, it's and again, you got little things like even just the. I guess it must be raining out right now, so because <laughs> it's uh, showing that. So um, so it, it took a lot of time to put it together, and I we finally dragged it across the, the finish line and, and now with some promotion and then I think it'll, it'll get a lot of use and it will, it's, there's still a lot of heavy Menominee centric stuff on it, but um, hopefully there'll be more opportunity to get some more outlying Dunn County um, locations and, and uh, businesses and other things on the site so that uh, it's, it has more stuff. And you saw that with just a little bit with the, the dine and drink category and and things to do are showing some of the the, the areas outside of of the outside of Menominee because they show up on the map. So, comments, questions. Your open tabbage makes my eyes hurt. <laughs> oh, you should see my computer at home. I have way more tabs open than that. Can't even see them all. Will people be able to submit their own events, or will it go through? It's like it's going to get vetted because otherwise, you're going to get lunatics submitting things that don't exist or would not be appropriate, probably. So, I I know there's a there's a nudist camp in St. Croix County. I don't know of one in Dunn County, but I probably don't need them submitting their events to our site, probably. But that's all I got. So tell everybody, share it, 
tell everybody go to visit duncounty.com and and uh learn more about the Dunn County. All right. Moving on in the agenda. Uh, there is no, there are no actions uh, to be taken by this committee. So our next meeting date is Tuesday, October 10th, 2023. Beyond that, are there any announcement, other announcements for the committee? If not, we are adjourned. The cows were submitted by, I don't know, somebody. <laughs> <laughs>